Hello, this is episode 307. Welcome, welcome. Today we're chatting about artificial estrogens. Now we talked about estrogens also in episode 302. We're on an estrogen kick over here on the Keto Diet Podcast. So if you want to learn more about estrogens, estrogen dominance, go back to episode 302 after you've listened to this episode. All good stuff. If you have questions about today's content, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me. You can also catch up on previous podcast episodes and notes from today's show by going to ketodietpodcast.com. Throughout today's episode and all of our episodes, I may refer to links or resources or additional items. Be sure to check out the show notes for that. If you're not sure how to check out the show notes on the app that you're using to listen to the podcast, just kind of click around, look for some options, or you can go to the Google machine and type in show notes and then the app that you're using. And there'll be a tutorial for sure using the app that shows you how to find the show notes for my show and all shows on your podcast app. Okay, let's do this thing. Hey, I'm Leanne Vogel, and you're listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. I've put together a free 21-page guide on achieving weight loss on your keto diet if nothing is working as a little thank you for being here today. Grab your free guide at ketoforwomen.com to get the steps you need to overcome the hurdles standing in your way. Hey, Dr. J, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Uh, For listeners that may not be familiar with your work, let's start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I'm actually the president of an international medical nonprofit. It's called the International Medical Research Collaborative. And we train medical students mainly, but also some medical doctors from different countries here in America. But uh, more recently, I've kind of utilized the work that I did when I was doing my PhD and wrote a book about artificial estrogen. So that's been a big focus for me, and it's been exciting. That is awesome. And let's start off by chatting a little bit about your book and what artificial estrogens are, because some people might not even know what an artificial estrogen is. Yeah, well, when I was doing my PhD, I did, I studied fats and cholesterol and hormones. And, you know, I came across some of this, these chemicals uh, called estrogenics, or artificial estrogens. And so what they are is, you know, anything, essentially any chemical that acts like estrogen in your body, but it's not estrogen. It's artificial. So for example, BPA is an artificial estrogen. That's why it's bad. It's because when you ingest BPA, it acts like estrogen in your body. And there's a number of these. I I actually created a top 10 list. And that's kind of what my book centers around is this top 10 list of artificial estrogens. And the, the real focus there was estrogens in our daily environment. And it's amazing how many of these we're exposed to. It's just unbelievable. And I think the biggest reason for that is because they're legal in America, whereas over in Europe, a lot of the, a surprising number of these are illegal. Yeah, and why is having too many of these estrogens bad? Because oftentimes on the podcast, we chat about how hormones can be low and we need more estrogen or progesterone. So somebody might be listening thinking, okay, but why is having estrogen a bad thing? Yeah, well, estrogen isn't a bad thing, but these artificial estrogens are bad. And it's because they throw off, number one, they throw off your natural estrogen level. And that obviously alters, you know, a hundred different things in your body. But also they lower your testosterone and in men and women, testosterone is important. But let me actually give you some numbers because uh, a lot of times, you know, men realize men like me recognize, well, we don't want artificial estrogen. We don't want estrogen in our bodies at high levels. But women, too, are, are impacted. And the numbers in men are about 20 nanograms per liter, 20 for estrogen. 20 nanograms per liter. And, but in women, they range, of course, depending on the time of the month, between 20 and 400 So it's really not that different during certain times of the month. And it's not like women are in the thousands and men are just 20. You know, I mean, the range is small. So this is a really small window and it's a delicate balance. So when you throw off these levels, you know, you have a big health impact in men and women. And the health impacts include breast cancer, 
which, by the way, is up 250 percent since 1980. And I, I personally think the reason for that is artificial estrogens. And that's global. I mean, that's an, the, the, just, the number I just gave you is America, but it's globally increasing. But it also causes weight gains, these artificial estrogens, because it essentially imitates pregnancy. It's telling your body that you're pregnant. And, you know, it's a natural thing when, when women are pregnant to store fat. And that's because fat is an efficient energy storage. It's an efficient form of energy. And of course, our ancestors didn't necessarily always have access to food. So they, you know, when you're pregnant, your baby needs this energy. So you store fat. It's a natural process. Problem is artificial estrogens, you know, hijack that process and cause increased fat storage. The other one is uh, immune system issues. You see, you see some depression. That's another big one. So a lot of health issues and a lot of common health issues from artificial estrogens that you see in our culture today. That's so amazing. And something that I think a lot of people don't even think of. I can't tell you how many times I've spoken with somebody and they're like, I've tried every diet, I've tried everything and I can't lose weight. And nine times out of 10, it's usually because their hormones are off. And what you're saying is, is it fair to say that if your hormones are imbalanced, it could be because of the artificial estrogens that you're, that they're thrown off because of these Artificial yep. estrogens? Okay. Yeah. And in fact, let me just throw another number at you just Deal. to give you yeah. some more gravity because, you know, I told you about 20 and the range of natural estrogen, 20 to 400. There's a herbicide called atrazine. It's the second, it's, most people haven't heard of it. Most people have heard of glyphosate, Roundup, which is the number one used herbicide in America. But the second most used herbicide in America, in North America, is atrazine. And they spray it on grains and corn. And they tested the blood. Of course, you remember in cows, they do these feedlot cows where they corn feed them. They send them to these huge feedlots. And they tested the blood from those corn-fed cows. And they found 700,000 nanograms per liter of atrazine in the blood. Oh, my gosh. That's yeah, so these levels are incredibly high. Obviously, that's going to cause a physiological impact. It's going to have an impact on your body. And it's, it's a bigger deal than people are realizing. So that's one of the reasons, you know, eating good fats makes a really positive impact on people because sometimes they're inadvertently eliminating artificial estrogens that are in these bad fats. Like if you go to the store and just buy conventional bacon, you know, a lot of times that's, of course, corn fed. You know, you've got a lot of other chemicals we can talk about. There's mold and there's something called mycoestrogen I write about, mold estrogen. It's, 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 it's my top 10 list. And it's, that's one of the problems with mold. You know, it's, it secretes mold, actually secretes a chemical called xerolinone. And I know that na that word is kind of obnoxious, but that's the way chemists <laughs> are. They make these crazy yeah, words. Yeah, it's always but, true. Yeah. <laughs> but xerolinone is an artificial estrogen, it acts like estrogen in our body. And in fact, my uncle who uh, used to raise pigs, he told me that whenever they fed the pigs moldy grain, the pigs would go into heat and have all kinds of hormonal issues just completely unnaturally, just from the moldy grain. So then they give them clay to kind of offset the mold. What? And that helps to bind some of these artificial estrogens. So obviously, that's one strategy to kind of help your body get rid of these artificial estrogens if you happen to eat them. But obviously, it's a lot better just not to eat them. Oh my gosh, you've just said so many things that I have questions about. Okay, so the first one is, for these cows that are getting fed the corn, and you're saying that there's thousands upon thousands of, what nanograms did you say? Per liter. Nanograms, nanograms per liter. Mm -hmm. Per liter. Same units. Okay, yep. same same units as humans. Okay, if you were to cook that meat, those estrogens are going to stay in there. They do, yeah. Yes. I, I uh, have studies showing that. Yeah. yeah. And, okay, my next question is... You mentioned like Roundup, the atrazine. Am I saying that right? Atrazine. How are people getting exposed to this? You talked about BPA. So we know that that's in plastics and things like that. And, and some companies are getting pretty good at saying like BPA free and all those things. Where are people finding these? We chatted about cattle and making sure that it's grass fed, grass finished. That's another thing um, because a lot of cattle can be grass fed and then they are plumped up and they're not grass finished and therefore you're probably getting some of those issues as well. Where can people find this in regular day to day and how to avoid them? Yeah. Good questions. <laughs> you did have a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, well, as far as atrazine goes, I mean, any non-organic corn and or grains, 
will have atrazine in America. Now, in now get this. Here's something that's important to know. Atrazine in Europe, completely illegal, 100% illegal. Zero is allowed. Zero is allowed in the groundwater, et cetera. And over here in America, that's another source of atrazine is we're drinking it. If you live in farm country, it ends up in the water supply. There's good studies to show that. And so does the birth control, by the way. So if people are in uh, really population dense areas, like I just moved to Minnesota from Boston, and Boston just has unbelievable amounts of birth control in the water, which, of course, is impacting the fertility of the, the animals in that area and obviously impacting people with, along with these ar- other artificial estrogens we're talking about. So you need to filter your water. I think that's more important than, uh, than ever right now. And you need to use activated charcoal. There's a lot of different filters out there. A lot of them work. Most of them work. Most of them have activated charcoal, but you want to be sure because I've literally published scientific papers using activated charcoal. I used to use it in the research lab to remove hormones, remove fats, remove cholesterol. It removes anything that's hydrophobic, which means anything that floats on top of water. It pulls that out. So it's good for grabbing all of these artificial estrogens. Because again, estrogen floats on water, as you probably know, as a lot of your listeners probably know. It's, you know, which is interesting because when it gets into your blood, remember your blood is like water. So these fats and hormones, you know, they can't just go into your blood. They have to go into like LDL particles in in terms of fats and cholesterol or HDL or that sort of thing, or sex hormone binding globulin in the case of uh, testosterone and estrogen, SHBG. CBD oil, I'm sure you've heard of it and maybe you've been a bit overwhelmed by the options or you're concerned it'll get you high. Now my family's been supplementing with CBD oil going on four years and I'm impressed with the results and no, we don't get high on this stuff and neither will you. Why do we use CBD oil? Well, it's a powerful anti-inflammatory, reducing joint issues, inflammatory acne, and gut distress. Eaton Hemp makes the highest possible quality CBD oil, are transparent in their production processes, and are one of the first USDA certified organic hemp companies, ensuring all you're getting in your oil is CBD, not pesticides. Blah, no thank you. Eaton Hemp uses hemp seed oil as a carrier for the CBD, which ensures higher potency, effectiveness, terpenes, and cannabinoids. These are all good things. Now, what I love most about Eaton Hemp is they stand behind their product. If you buy it and you don't like it or you don't get the results that you're looking for, they will give you a refund. All you got to do is use it in the first 30 days and let them know in those first 30 days, no questions asked, they will give you your money back. Now, they put together a super special offer for our listeners. If you go to eatenhemp.com slash keto diet and use the code keto diet, you will get 20% off all of their CBD products. Again, that's code keto diet at eatenhemp.com slash keto diet for your 20% off and your 30 day money back guarantee. What have you found the best water filter is? I use a Berkey. I don't know if you know if that's good or not. It's something that yep. I really love. And yep. okay, great. Yay, that's, win. Okay. Well, that's exactly what I use. Yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, mega points for me because I was really nervous. I carry that thing around with me everywhere. We live in our RV and my husband was like, we're not taking that with us. And we're like, I was like, yes, we are. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'll include a link in the show notes to the Berkey system. I've been using it for probably four years and it's pretty inexpensive when all is said and done and it's really easy to fill and yay, no estrogens. I like it. And it's not plastic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is an issue for sure. And and you mentioned BPA and how most of the bottles nowadays, they're coming out BPA free, which is true. And that's really good. But you know, honestly, BPA should just be totally illegal if it's anywhere near food products. But here's what companies have done. So in America, BPA, of course, is still legal, but 17 states have come out and made it illegal, at least in children's and babies' products, at least. But here's what the companies have done. And I can tell you this as a scientist, kind of as an insider. They changed the... So BPA stands for bisphenol A. What companies do when BPA is illegal, oftentimes, at least unethical companies, is they, they just use a chemical called BPS, bisphenol S. Or there's a number of other ones. There's like BPAF, BPF. Again, a, a long list of these that are that are just as problematic. I've got a paper that I, you know, I can obviously reference in my book, and I quote from this research paper. It says these BPA analogs, these chemicals that are just like BPA, 
they're just as estrogenic, if not worse, in your body. So the, oftentimes, the BPA-free can be just as bad. There's at least potential for that. So you even have to be careful. In general, it's better just to avoid plastics where you can, especially if you're heating it, of course. And especially if you're long, if you're storing something long term in plastic. It makes you really angry when you hear that stuff, right? It's like, seriously, guys, come on. Well, it's oftentimes these companies, they're on, you know, they're on the stock market and the bottom line is kind of what's motivating a lot of them. And they're, they're, of course, influencing the politicians. And that's a whole other issue and a problem and a topic for a different day, probably. Yeah. And I really, it really comes down to the moment that you realize that it's just you and you need to know these things in order to protect your own health. <laughs> like, it's unfortunate that it's like that. But I mean, I'm looking at my Yeti stainless steel water bottle right now. And I love that thing. And there's no plastic on it. And it keeps things warm and cold and all the things and even right beside that because I packed a lunch today I have my um I think it's a Stanley thermos also completely stainless steel so these things cost a little bit more money but at the end of the day like I've had that Stanley thermos for like six years and it's still going strong so it's just about making those decisions and even knowing that information I think the conversation about grass-fed grass-finished meat isn't talked about enough. And I had no idea that regular cattle would have that much. Sometimes I don't care about the quality of my meat. And I'm like, eh, it's not so bad. But seriously, yeah. that's pretty bad. Yeah. I know I'm I'm a convert. I used to tell people not like three or four years ago, I used to say, yeah, you know, the fat is important, but the, the actual meat, you know, is probably not that big of a deal. Yeah. But I've come around now. I've seen the numbers. I've seen the research. And boy, you know, and, and it skews the science, too. So these scientific researchers go up and they test, you know, a quote unquote animal product diet. And then they compare that to a plant product diet or something. And it skews the results because what's in a lot of these animal products? What products are they buying? They're just buying conventional bacon, conventional whatever, conventional meats. And it's skewing the results. It's causing a lot of health problems. And of course, they're con they're concluding that the health problems are originating from meat. And that's one of the reasons there's so much conflicting research on this topic in terms of, you know, vegetarian versus, you know, animal products, animal protein, all of this. There's a lot of confusing science. And I, I think it really, it's important you read it, you look at that science through the lens of these artificial chemicals, you know, what chemicals are these, what, what chemicals are in these, these uh, meat products. That's really scary. And what's the difference between estrogenics and xenoestrogens? Is there a difference? Not too much. So xeno uh, comes from the Greek and it means alien. I think it literally translates as alien. And I took a couple of years of Greek in college. Amazing. <laughs> because it helps me uh, with my science. So artificial, so xeno means alien, means completely foreign. And estrogenics, which is the term I, I like to use, uh, encompasses kind of anything that acts on your estrogen receptor. And the reason I use that term as opposed to xeno is because I include soy as a problem food and obviously mycoestrogen, which I already mentioned, mold estrogen. And those aren't necess those aren't xenoestrogen in the true sense. They're not, you know, they're not foreign. They're actually created naturally by plants or molds, but they're still problematic. They still act like estrogen. So I still tell people, watch out, you know, especially with soy, because there's a lot of money behind that and a lot of influence on the scientific researchers to promote soy. But the estrogen in soy, in my opinion, is really unhealthy. Let's chat a little bit more about soy because there are a lot of people listening that do like a low carb, high fat thing where they don't eat a lot of meat products. And when you don't eat a lot of meat products, you're probably eating a lot of canned beans and a lot of maybe tempeh or tofu or things. Let's chat a little bit about maybe the problems surrounding the canned goods and also the soy stuff. Yeah, well, tempeh, I'm glad you brought that specifically up because uh, there was a paper, there's a scientific research paper. It showed that, uh, well, they, they researched over 100 plant food items and it was beautiful as far as I'm concerned because they quantified how much plant estrogen or phytoestrogen was in all of these foods in this single study. And they essentially found most foods have almost no plant estrogen, phytoestrogen. Like, for example, chickpeas have nine micrograms per 100 gram of chickpeas. So nine micrograms, really low. You know, black beans had like 10, something like, I mean, just super low numbers. But soy had over 100,000 micrograms per 100 gram. But here's where, and, and all the products, right? like tofu, even soy protein, like you'd think it was just the isolated protein, that had 8,000 micrograms. So... Basically, everything was under 1,000, 
except for soy and flax, by the way. So those two plants I, I, I'm careful with. But here's the thing about soy. When they looked at soy sauce, like naturally fermented soy sauce, not industrial American produced soy sauce that cuts corners and probably doesn't actually ferment the stuff, but actual fermented soy sauce had 100 micrograms. So well below 1000, well below concerning levels. So tempeh is another one that's, you know, naturally fermented, miso, natto, those kind of things healthy. There's no problem because the bacteria break down the phytoestrogen. And that happens a lot with flax too. Again, I mentioned flax. Obviously, we don't usually eat that much flax. And assuming you're not you know, eating a ton of it, if you have healthy gut bacteria, and that's a big if because a lot of people today don't, don't. <laughs> but if you do, it breaks those down. So it's important to know. And the fermentation, of course, breaks them down. Yeah, I'm really happy you mentioned flax because I had really, really, really low estrogens a couple of years ago. And I ate so much flax and other things, but I attribute a lot of my increase in estrogen to flax because I would eat probably about a half a cup a day. <laughs> and that's why when people say, you know, I have a history of breast cancer things, I always say, I would just not even eat flax. Would that be fair? I agree. Yeah. I, 100%. In fact, flax was 300,000 micrograms. That's, you know, how much phytoestrogen it had. And it has a different phytoestrogen. It's called lignans. And it gets a little complicated. I mentioned this in my book. My most important kind of goal when I was writing my book was to simplify all this, simplify the science, make it just completely usable and readable for people. Just because I do talk like a scientist sometimes, I just out of habit, I accidentally start saying technical things like lignans and isoflavones. And <laughs> most of us might be able to follow you. So feel free to let your inner geek out. Um, your book does such a great job at keeping things really simple. And I totally oh, appreciated that when I was reading it. But yeah, yeah, I think some people can definitely follow you down that rabbit hole. Yeah. But, so, but there is some differences between flax and soy in terms of the actual plant estrogen that's in there. So it's a little bit complicated, but definitely, I, I definitely avoid flax. I mean, some people are taking so much of it. I mean, it's it's risky, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And would you say, is there a misconception around the fact that if I eat flax and my estrogen goes up, like that's a plant versus if I eat conventional meat that has a ton of estrogens in it, that can't be safe. Or is it basically the same thing? It's just one is a plant, one is an animal. They're the same thing. I'm definitely more positive, and I don't mean I'm positive, but I'm more positive about plant estrogens because our ancestors ate a lot of these. And, they're, you know, so the gut bacteria break them down. We've adapted. Our bodies have seen these before. Whereas in, the, in a lot of the animal products and personal care products, which we haven't even mentioned, and the plastics, and again, the birth control, and the red food coloring, by the way, which is an artificial estrogen, uh, red number three and red number 40, you know, our bodies have never seen these before. Our ancestors have never seen these, you know, our physio, we're, we're just not adapted to dealing with those. So I'm a lot more concerned about those and more cautious about those. Mm, yeah. Okay. Brilliant. We all know the health benefits of salmon, rich in omega-3, selenium, vitamin D, the nutrients that keep your thyroid and metabolism revved up and your skin looking glowy and healthy. But a lot of us steer clear of fish because of accessibility, cost, and taste. Some of that store-bought stuff really has a rank taste and smell to it, am I right? Not Wild Alaskan Seafood Box, a salmon delivery service that takes wild caught to a whole new level. Their seafood is wild caught from Alaska via small boat fishermen working directly with friends and families to deliver the freshest, most authentic seafood right to your home. From the local small mom and pop processor in Petersburg, Alaska to you. You can go to wildalaskanseafoodbox.com slash KDP to load up. Plus get $25 off your first order. Again, that's wildalaskanseafoodbox.com slash KDP. Use the code KDP for $25 off your first order. Why don't we get the health, like makeup, body care stuff out of the way too? Because I know that's a huge topic as well. And something like I've switched over my body wash, my toothpaste, like basically everything except my makeup. And I've tried to find natural sources of makeup and I do use natural stuff on days off. But when I'm in front of a camera and there's like lights and cameras, 
I use MAC makeup and I know it's really bad for my skin, but I just haven't gotten there yet. So let's chat a little bit about how bad that is for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one. I'm, I'm not an expert in what makeup you should use, unfortunately, <laughs> but I do have a lot of ideas. In fact, I actually created a page on my website for people. I don't make any money off of it. It's just products that I personally use and it, it's at ajconsultingcompany.com slash what I use. And that's all one word, what I use. And it just says like, I use this toothpaste, I use this soap, whatever. And it sounds like you and I have pretty much the same, you know, train of thought on all of this. And the biggest, the biggest ones in fragrances, and by the way, I have seen red food coloring in fragrances, which obviously irritates me because again, it's illegal in a lot of countries. Japan, red 40 is totally illegal. In Europe, it's legal to use red 40 but they have to put a big warning label on the food that says it may cause health problems in children. So nobody uses it. I've, t- I've been on podcasts in Europe. I've talked to people over there. They say they use red beet juice, you know, and but you see it all the time in America, including personal care products once in a while, like bars of soap and things. But the biggest ones are parabens and phthalates and parabens especially are a problem. I mean, they're both completely estrogenic and parabens, you know, they, they hide them on the label. They hide both of those parabens and phthalates. And by the way, phthalates, it's spelled P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S, phthalates. But they hide them on the label. They just say perfume. And under that term, they're legally allowed to just put, quote unquote, proprietary or secret ingredients. And they use a lot of these cheap fillers like parabens and phthalates. Again, so angry right now. Um, (laughs) Yeah, and it's a problem too because you go to like Walgreens or something like that. We're in the USA right now. And if I run out of body wash and we're not near, you know, a Whole Foods or something, I'm looking at the back of these things and I'm thinking like, they look fine. Like for the average person, they're looking through this. They're like, cool. It smells nice. It's got soap. What else do I need? But now I just use Castel soap. I've been using Castel soap for like the last, I don't know, 14 years. That's what I use. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. And it's so yep. cheap. A bottle lasts me yep. two years. And yep. but it's, you know, we we when you wash your body with some of these things, they don't lather up like they that you're used to, and then you think you're not clean, and there's a lot of problems with it. So I'll make sure to include that link to what you use, and I'll also include in the show notes a couple of tips on what I use too. Um, cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I was just on Jimmy Moore's podcast and I didn't mention that. And of course, I got a barrage of emails saying, like, what products do what? you use? And I, yeah. I heard you mention that, but you didn't say the website. So, <laughs> Okay, awesome. We'll make sure to put it in the notes for the show, which will be at healthfulpursuit.com forward slash podcast forward slash E54. And Dr. J's list will be there. I'll put together a list of some of the things that I like to because, yeah, it's a huge process to kind of overhaul this, but also really important. So in case people aren't really... Sh- like sure about all this let's say there's a human and they don't really care about their body products they're eating conventional meat they're drinking out of plastic water bottles like what's the reality like what is their body going through what's happening with what they're doing well it's 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 a mess because number one these artificial estrogens they bind to your shbg your sex hormone binding globulin which you know causes essentially tells your body that you've got high levels of estrogen when you don't for real, but the artificial estrogen, that's what signals to your body. And that, again, because testosterone and estrogen both bind to that same protein, they both shuttle around your blood. I call it the limo service for uh, <laughs> for sex hormones, SHBG, because, of course, again, they float on water, these hormones, so they need to get into this protein and get shuttled around your blood. So they disrupt both the estrogen and the testosterone levels. And I mean, the other thing, you know, with the fat gains, so they signal fat gains. We know exactly how they do it. They do it through a protein called PPAR gamma, which again, really technical, but that's what, that's just how they, they function. And they basically tell your body, grow more fat, you know, like increase the fat size. And the crazy thing is, is I call it the estrogenic paradox, because not only do they tell your, your body to make more fat or store more fat. But they also tell your body, or, or they actually store in the fat as well. These chemicals store in the fat. They get into the fat. They stay in the fat. And the average life of a fat cell is a year and a half. And in fact, they've scientists have found fat cells that have in humans that have that are ten years old. And so obviously that can be a problem. These things can stay in your body for a long time, and that makes it difficult to lose weight because 
you've got them in there. These little chemicals are in there and they're saying, keep that fat, store more fat, right? So they're, they're contradicting what you might be doing with your diet when you're trying to lose the weight. So it becomes a struggle. And could other like health imbalances be caused by this? Like if you have too much estrogen in your body, cancer? For sure. Other things? Usually, usually it's breast cancer, but mm -hmm. it, it definitely causes other types of cancer. And I wrote about this. I wrote a piece on, in my, like a small subsection of my book about cancer because the most concerning part of it is the aspect of epigenetics. And what that means is these hormones, the estrogen, when it binds the receptor inside the cell, it actually, bind, it actually goes and binds onto the DNA directly. It directly interacts with the DNA. And that obviously causes, you know, changes in your body. Like I said, fat changes and all this other stuff. But it also alters the DNA. There's actually marks on your DNA. And we scientists call them epigenetics. Epi just means upon, on top of. So it's on top of the genetics, on top of the DNA. And the crazy thing about that is it gets passed to future generations. And that's kind of the culmination of my book, kind of like the punchline of the whole book is, yeah, we're affecting our health. But the more important problem is we're affecting future generations through this because it's passed on. And you see that in the animal studies, of course, because you can do multi-generations real quickly. And you see cancer can be passed on like increased risk of cancer, obesity can be passed on, and infertility, like decreasing infertility can be passed on. They've seen it up to three or four generations, you know, in, in like I said, in animal models. Whoa. <laughs> That's amazing. Like amazing that this happens and frustrating that this is happening. And people like you are writing books and coming on podcasts to chat about it. And the general population doesn't know about it. And that yeah, it's really a little bit. Me. What I what I tried to do in my book to simplify it is to say, look, if you're a musician and you write musical notes, like say you had a song like Mary Had a Little Lamb, you write those. It's just black notes on a staff. Da, 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 da. It's just single notes, and you can pass that to somebody else, and they can play that same song without ever having heard it or without knowing you, etc. That's like your DNA. You can. It's pretty simple. You can pass it on. And it's pretty similar. But epigenetics would be like when you put chords on top of those notes. You put more notes. And so it makes it's the song is still the same, like the DNA is still the same, but it's more complex and it's more, you know, more beautiful. And essentially that's what these epigenetic marks are like. They're like those extra notes on top of the DNA. And those can get changed a lot easier. They don't affect the, you know, the DNA, they don't affect the song. But they definitely, well, they affect the song, but they don't, right? They don't, uh, they don't affect the, uh, the DNA. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little confused on my own analogy, but you know what, you know what I mean? Yeah. The marks are getting affected. It's these, these cords can be changed pretty, pretty quickly, especially with these chemicals that our bodies have never seen before. And it's becoming people, scientists especially are becoming more and more aware. So I'm trying to bring that out to the lay person. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this work. Muchly appreciated. I really hope you're enjoying today's episode. I'd love to see where you're listening from. You can snap a pic and tag me at Leanne Vogel or leave a review for the show on your favorite podcast player. It helps me out tremendously. Okay, back to the good stuff. How do we test to see if this is a problem for us? I mean, we can look at, you know, we chatted about the conventional meat and the personal health products, water bottles, what we're cooking with, I'm sure, also pots, pans, those sorts of things. How do we know if we're being exposed to it? Is there a way that we can run a test or what we can look at if we get a hormone panel tested? Right. That's a tough one. I mean, there's not really any great you know, like, because there's so many of them, for one, there's parabens, there's phthalates, there's BPA, there's, you know, all these different things. So scientists in research labs like me, we can, and by the way, I'm doing a fellowship right now at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, but we can measure these things pretty simply. You know, we can go into our lab, shut the door, <laughs> run this, mm. run this stuff, but there's not, you know, like a high throughput test that's out there that's standardized for everybody. So what I usually tell people, I mean, number one, if you've got breast cancer, weight issues, you know, you're struggling with the weight, low, you know, that's an indicator. But low testosterone is especially good indicator because these chemicals directly lower your free testosterone and your total testosterone. And that's a pretty easy thing to measure because a lot of people do it already. So that's a good way to start. And you will see a difference if you eliminate these artificial estrogens on this top 10 list I have. 
and you track your uh, testosterone, again, it's not ideal, it's not perfect, but that's the best I can recommend for people. And so let's say that we've tested our testosterone, it's low, we've eliminated these items. Is there anything else we can do to kind of like, quote unquote, flush the system? Uh, you Definitely. mentioned like activated charcoal, like, could we yep. take activated charcoal? Is there something yep. else? I actually recommend people to use a sauna during kind of like a detox protocol. There's a scientist over in Scandinavia. His name is Yari Laukinen. And he, re- he, he did a bunch of research on saunas and how healthy they are, the health benefits. They decrease all cause mortality. In other words, like you dying of anything, saunas decrease that. Doesn't matter what it is, heart disease, Alzheimer's, all this stuff. And one of the reasons they do that is they speed up molecular motion. You know, the molecules move faster. And that, uh, that moves hormone, these artificial hormones out of your cells into your blood, allows your body to clear them. And so assuming you're not continue, continuing to eat or rub these things on your skin, you know, you get saunas help because it gets that stuff moving. It gets it flushing, you know, it starts, but you have to go at least 10 minutes, according to Yari Laukinen, you know, between 10 and 20 minutes seems to be the, you know, the ideal range of time to sit in a sauna to help get rid of some of this stuff. Of course, exercise helps just, you know, and by the way, keto diet definitely helps in, in eating good fats. I mean, that's a huge part of this. Yeah. The good fats, because there's a very different keto to keto can be different. Like some people eat the conventional bacon and the mayonnaise with the canola oil and all these pieces that the refined oils and things is very different from like grass fed, grass finished tallow (laughs) and like local pastured uh, raised bacon. Um, There's a huge gap in the keto space. And in some ways, you know, this conversation definitely reiterates the fact that, I mean, if you're doing keto with all these horrible fats and horribly raised animal products, that can't be good. That yeah. can't be good. <laughs> yeah. And I just started keto, by the way. I read your book. I loved it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I read great. it a long time. I read it, I don't know, a month or two ago, but I just started keto about two weeks ago. Just 100%. I'm going eight, like all in and I'm doing 80% fat, 15% protein, 5% carbs, really strict. You know, I, I want to really experience the whole thing. <laughs> and I love it. I'm really, obviously... I already kind of have known some of this because I'm a scientist and I like to kind of play around with the tamp, you know, tamper with my tinker. I mean, tinker with my diet and exercise and all this. But ketones just amp up my brain. It's just unbelievable. I just love it. But this diet especially, it works just great. Oh, that's so good. I'm so glad. Thanks so much for reading my book. I'm so honored because I read yours and I was like, wow, this guy's super smart. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm honored. Okay, so can estrogenics affect other hormones like insulin or have you looked into that? And, And if so, how does that happen? Yeah, so there's a really interesting study. It was in a journal called Public Library of Science Plus. And it's actually I have the title written down here. So I'm going to read it to you because people should look this up if they're if they're interested in the insulin response. It's called chronic exposure, you know, which, of course, most Americans are chronic exposure to the herbicide atrazine causes mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin resistance. And what they did was they they simply had two groups of rats and they fed just exactly the same food, exactly the same exercise. Everything was just super controlled. But the only difference was they fed low dose atrazine. And I emphasize the word low because that's what we're getting oftentimes in our drinking water. If you're not filtering low dose atrazine, they put it in the drinking water of these rats of one group of the rats. And that group got fat. They got fatty livers. They got all kinds of fat. And they essentially did some more refined studies and found that it was causing insulin resistance. I'm not exactly sure how, and I don't think they were either, but it definitely impacts your ability to use insulin. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, so there's just yeah, so that's, many that's, pieces. I think, Leanne, that's kind of the, a good argument for not calorie, like how bad calorie counting is, because these people in the scientific community, it's amazing how many people are taught, and I was taught this way. That calorie counting is everything. You know, you got to count your calories. It's your fault if you're fat because you're not counting your calories or whatever. But this is a perfect example. The reason I like this study and even have it written down here is because it's a perfect example of how calorie counting doesn't work. These rats had the exact same number of calories, yet one group got fat. And you see this in other examples, too, with like the fecal transplants where they transplant, you know, literally transplant poop from one group of mice to another group. Like you have a fat group and a skinny group and you transplant it and it turns the skinny mice fat just from the gut bacteria. Yeah. You see this in all kinds of studies, but 
I mean, in terms of artificial estrogen, it's just such a compelling argument that calorie counting isn't everything. You've got to, you've got to clean up the calories, you know? Yeah, totally. I couldn't agree with you more. And I love those sorts of studies when it's like, whoa, wait, what happened? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Just because of your bacteria in your gut, that can cause such a huge drastic change in your weight. And I think a lot of us, I just came back from a book tour and so many people were like, I've plateaued, you know, keto worked for X weeks and now it's not working anymore. What am I doing wrong? I'm like, take a look outside of the calories. You know, they're saying I'm eating 800 calories. Why aren't I losing? weight. I'm like, you need to stop first off because lowering your calories is not going to help. In fact, it will probably make it worse because now you're just not eating enough and there's all these other things going on. So I really like that we're having this conversation outside of calorie counting, what could be going on with your weight specifically. And if somebody's in this place and feeling super frustrated and they've heard you say, you know, eliminating the items, I'm guessing like a near infrared sauna would probably be beneficial. That's ideal. Okay, yep. awesome. I'll include a link in the show notes for my favorite. It's called uh, Sauna Space Pocket Sauna. I don't have it with me in my house anymore and I'm super sad about it. I need to figure out a different solution that I can take with me. So if anyone has recommendations on mini tiny little saunas, I'm not sure. But so what are your thoughts on some Something like DIM to detoxify estrogen from the body. Would that work for estrogenics or not so much? Like diindole methane? Yeah. I've read studies about it. I didn't include it in my book because it's still kind of up in the air in terms of it's tricky, I think, you know. Different between different people, of course. I mean, somewhat in some term in to some degree everything is. But it can act like estrogen in your body or it can block Estro, you know, these artificial estrogens, it seems like it has kind of a dual role depending on the dose. And that's kind of how these estrogen receptors sometimes work. And that's also a, a source of confusion for people is, well, if you take a little bit, it actually blocks estrogen. But if you take a lot, it acts like estrogen. You know what I mean? It gets over this certain threshold and actually activates the estrogen receptor. And diindole methane seems to do that, but it also seems to, uh, you know, lower people's estrogen. So there's kind of this fine balance on that one. And I'm not a super expert in it, but, you know, I don't have any problem with it. But you just have to be aware that it can actually cause the opposite of what you're looking for. Yeah, I tried dim once and I will never try it again. I was like, why? Why is this allowed? <laughs> like, It did yeah. not work for me. <laughs> OK, and then so we chat a little bit about mitochondria being affected by this. And we know that intermittent fasting can be beneficial on a cellular level, specifically mitochondria. Like, is there a connection between fasting and helping with this detoxification, I guess you could call it, of estrogenics when it comes to fasting on a ketogenic diet. Have you looked into whether or not fasting would be beneficial? Yeah, oh, for sure. And in fact, fasting is, I would distinguish, and I know you do, but I'm just saying I would distinguish between fasting and keto because, you know, people eating a lot of carbs can still do an intermittent fast and still see benefits. And in terms of these artificial estrogens, let's just look at fasting first. And fasting, of course, causes your body to mobilize fats and start burning fats for fuel in the mitochondria. And just mobilizing those fats, kind of, you know, burning those some of those fats, of course, releases some estrogen, gets rid of some of these, I should say, artificial estrogen, gets rid of some of these artificial estrogens. So that's obviously a beneficial thing, just specific to artificial estrogen. And ketosis, eating, actually eating the fats, is kind of a double win. It's a win-win because not only are you teaching your body to burn fats and you're mobilizing more fats, but you're also, this is probably, I'm going to write another book. It's called Blubber Brain. I'm actually working on it right now. A lot of people don't know about this, but it's just going to be a book about fats, good fats, bad fats, cholesterol especially, and a lot of the impacts on your brain. But one of the things about, one of the things that's interesting with the keto diet is fats, especially free fatty acids, are transported. Again, those float on water, so they're not going to go into the blood. And of course, you, you know about LDL and HDL and all that, but they're also transported on a protein called albumin. Mm -hmm. And albumin can literally, you can stick nine fatty acids onto albumin. It's got a bunch of different sites for binding fatty acids. And the reason I bring it up is because albumin also can transport estrogen and artificial estrogen. So if you're eating a lot of fat and you're transporting a lot of fat through your blood, you're going to kick a lot of this artificial estrogen off of albumin and force your body to clear it out. I know it's a little bit complicated and I haven't, you know, I haven't quite nailed it in terms of how I can simplify that. 
but it's a reality. It's a, it's one of the, the super benefits of the keto diet, but that's beyond intermittent fasting. That is so cool. I did not know that. That is really, really cool. I have learned a lot from you today. This is really great. <laughs> um, okay, so very quickly, where can people find you? And why don't we talk a little bit more about your book, what it's about, where people can find it, what the title is, all the things. Yeah, so the book is called Estro Generation because, again, it's how you can pass on some of these health problems from artificial estrogen. Estro Generation, how estrogenics are making you fat, sick, and infertile. That's the book. Of course, I have a medical nonprofit, but that's kind of caters to international medical students. So, you know, don't look that up <laughs> if you're looking for me. <laughs> it's better to look for my AJ Consulting Company because I've shifted focus into kind of you know, writing. And especially I do a YouTube video every week where I try and simplify some scientific idea. And that's all on my AJ Consulting Company page, as well as my contact info. Amazing. Cool. We will include some of the links to your show and a bunch of different things in the show notes. So people can check that out, including a link to your book. Yeah. So thanks so much for coming on the show today, Dr. J. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. Music for the Keto Diet Podcast provided by Yechi. Follow Jacob on Instagram at Yechi underscore official and on Spotify as Yechi. That's Y-E-C-H-I. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.